Lovely as a former geography teacher myself to be speaking to geographers. I feel as if, unlike many of the audiences that I present in front of amongst friends today, which is, uh, which is a very nice feeling. Uh, Mike asked me to set the context of where we might go with geography and share with you what is happening out there in the wider educational world, because there is a lot happening. And very often, uh, it's my sense that uh, we're actually in a bit of a parallel universe. Before I start, however, uh, I will make available these slides. I've included slides that I'm not going to spend very much time on, because I think it's important that you understand the, the kind of direction of travel, and as much as I can share that with you just now, partly based on the recommendations that I made in my own report, but also through some of the work that Louise Hayward is doing and some of the other reviews that are taking place in educational firmament at the moment. As I say, it is a bit of a, a parallel universe because most of you who are practitioners, your day-to-day -day thoughts are around what's happening on the left-hand side of that, just getting the, the day job done, whilst this parallel world of reviews and goodness knows what else, not just my own report, uh, the national discussion that I know many of you took part in, uh, the qualifications review that Louise Hayward will talk about, uh, there's a skills delivery landscape review taking place just now which involves Skills Development Scotland and Scottish Funding Council, and there will be an education reform bill that the government will produce uh, in May. And everything is really targeting towards that. So although there's a lot happening, and one of the beefs I have with government is that it hasn't been well articulated as to how these bits of the jigsaw actually fit together or will fit together, uh, they will come together in some sense when the Education Reform Bill is produced in May. As Mike hinted at, one of the catalysts for my report was the OECD saying, there's a lot that's not right about Curriculum for Excellence, and I've just highlighted on this slide some of the key concerns that OECD had. And a lot of those concerns came through what I heard from the extensive engagement I had with not just practitioners like yourselves, but also with children and young people in schools. So it was pretty clear when I started my piece of work, which was basically to replace uh, SQA with something, to reform Education Scotland and to recreate an independent inspectorate. It was pretty clear from a very early stage in the feedback that I was getting that the Scottish education system actually looks a bit like this. For a country with five and a half million, it is far too complex. And particularly that middle ground between policy and what happens at the sharp end in practice is a very confused landscape. And how decisions are made and how policy is created was something that, you know, who's been part of it for many years, was still confusing to me. And I made it very clear to the Cabinet Secretary very early on that not only would I fulfil my commitment to do the three things that she asked me to do, but I would also look to try and use a report that set an agenda for the future. Because my concerns really surrounded this diagram, and again, I'm not going to go through it in detail, but we have a very top-down system in Scotland. It's largely driven by examinations. The curriculum is almost exclusively driven by examinations. And that's not just in secondary schools. Head teachers like Jonathan from Falkirk are telling me in primary, the upper primary curriculum is increasingly by dri being driven by what secondary schools or what schools in primary think is needed in order to transition easily from upper primary into secondary, which of course is largely dominated by the examination system. And of course, we fell foul during COVID of having a very traditional Victorian examination system where almost everything was externally assessed. And there was a huge emphasis on knowledge and understanding. And in spite of what SQA have said to many of us, including myself over many years, the examinations do not test the kinds of things that we as geographers in particular, and in many other subjects, deem to be important. And I'm going to suggest to you that the kind of changes that are required and will take place, I work with Louise on her strategic group, the kind of changes that we're envisaging for qualifications and examination, I think will open a door to the kinds of things that we as geographers value and think will benefit young people 
as they move forward. And it's not just about getting a higher in geography or getting an A in an advanced higher. It's about the kinds of skills and competencies that need to be developed. And having those skills and competencies and dispositions and attitudes not just recognised, but seriously valued much more than is the case at the moment. SQA will say, well, we build skills into the, the existing examinations. No, they don't. It's dominated by knowledge and understanding, and it's dominated in such a way that that narrows what we're able to teach within the geography curriculum. So I think there are opportunities to change this kind of top-down diagram from having a government and having a, an organisation like SQA that dictates in many ways the curriculum to one that is a much more bottom-up approach. And I'll, I'll explain to you what I mean by that. You can see from this diagram that, that middle ground between policy and practice, between government and what happens at the sharp end, is dominated by a large number of organisations. My view is there are too many of them. And there are too many doing very similar things that add to the confusion. The issue for me, uh, for government, is that the way in which education is governed in Scotland is an issue that needs to be looked at. And I make it very clear in my report that reform has to take place at all levels. And I've made it very clear that if we have 10 directorates in Scottish government impacting daily on education, and those 10 directorates don't talk to each other, which very often they don't, all we can expect is very fragmented policy. And it makes it doubly more difficult for local authorities and schools to then interpret that policy. It's well-meaning policy. No, no civil servant is sitting in Victoria Key or St Andrew's House writing policy that they think won't be helpful. The issue is that it's not coherent. And it makes life doubly more difficult for folk in schools then to translate that into practice. And at the sharp end, there is very limited agency in spite of the rhetoric there's very little agency or empowerment being given to the system, to those experts on the ground, to devise a curriculum, to make suggestions as to how curriculum needs to change, and to have much more of a say in the governance of education than is currently the case. So part of what I was trying to do in my report was to change the direction of travel from this diagram to a much more upward hierarchy from the expertise and using that expertise much more so. And of course, setting the context for the future, we need to recognise that technology and technological change is with us. Uh, you know from the students that you have in your school that how they use and engage in technology is something that is just part and parcel of their DNA. So how do we embrace that within geography and within the curriculum more generally? Students change as well. The type of students that we have now, the so-called Generation Alpha, uh, students who, as, as is often said, you know, have a digital footprint before they can walk. You know, the kind of youngsters that we have in our schools are hugely different to the kinds of youngsters that we've had in the past. And if we want them to get a meaningful experience out of education, we need to find ways in which we can articulate with the ways in which they now learn, which are very different to the kind of youngsters that we've had in the past. Jim Bruce is here as my follow, fellow HMI in geography, and I remember us having a discussion about a maths teacher who once told me that uh, he had taught the same thing for 25 years, and how dare an HMI criticise their, their lessons, because it had never done him any harm. And that loses sight of the reason why we're here, and why I call this report Putting Learners at the Centre. We're providing a service to those learners so that they can thrive in the future, and so that their children can thrive in the future. And that's the kind of time scale that I'm thinking about for this reform programme. So we need to be aware of how students are changing. And you can see a graph there, a, a table, that shows that now one third of students presenting in primary and secondary schools in Scotland have a, an additional support need. And that's not going to change quickly. So again, how do we, how do we uh, cope and how do we deal and how do we offer that much varied, much more varied range of young people who present very diffi difficult and different circumstances to us. How do we provide a geography curriculum that meets those kinds of needs? And I don't need to say much about climate change because it will be a key driver, undoubtedly, in the future. It's the one thing that many children that I interviewed spoke about 
Why can we not do more about biodiversity and climate change? And there is an absolute opening there for geography uh, as a subject to, to lead and to be a, an important part of that. And we need to remember that society has changed as well. You might not see the two pictures, but there were two pictures taken by the same photographer at the same point when the Pope in the 1980s uh, was, uh, was on the balcony uh, at, uh, in the Vatican City. And the right-hand one is the most recent Pope. And you can see that on the right-hand side, uh, it is full of iPads and, and phones taking photographs, whereas the 1981 folk were clapping. And for me, that's a real indication of just how much society has changed. And because society is influenced by what happens in education and how society's changes influence education, we need to be very mindful of that. And economic change, of course, another critical factor that we need to look at. The one certainty in the next 10 years is there will not be as much money about for education as perhaps there has been in the past. This is an extract from an essay uh, Anthony Painter from the Royal Society of Arts wrote three essays and one of them, the final one, was called Voice from a Future Generation and he places himself in the year 2080 and he looks back over the last 30 years of his life. And I've used this as a catalyst with teachers to basically say, so what does this mean? Should some, most or all of that happen? And of course some of it is happening just now. How do we prepare children and young people through our subject of geography and through the education system to deal with that kind of scenario. Hopefully not as extreme as Anthony Painter uh, suggests it might be, but how do we prepare them for a society that can thrive and for individuals that can thrive? So when we begin to think about what the geography curriculum might look like in the future, just as I did when I was preparing my report, I think we do need to look at some of the research that has come out. And one of the most influential ones for me was the, the UNESCO 2019 report on future skills and competencies. And you can see there, and I'm sure this is not new to many of you, you can see there the range of skills, competencies, dispositions and so on that are deemed to be important for the future. And there's a huge consistency in the educational research around the kinds of things that we need to be implanting within our curriculum in order that young people can survive. And it's not just about passing a higher geography or passing a higher English or the number of examination passes you get in a single sitting in S5. The metrics around what we value need to change significantly. And I think with what we're proposing, which will come out sometime after May, for the revising of the examinations and qualifications will give you a fair insight into how much that change will be quite radical. And it's one of the reasons why one of your speakers today, uh, Victoria Vardy, has a project called Gen Plus, which I've been fascinated by. Because one of the things about that project, and Victoria will say more about it later, is that it looks at giving greater value and stress and recognition to some of these skills and competencies that develop leaders for the future. And of course, I say it's consistent with a lot of what's happening in research around the world. For those of you who have got an education background, uh, Michael Fullen uh, and uh, uh, one or two others have identified six global competencies and for your benefit have set out what they deem them to be. So the question I would have is, looking to the future, how does a geography curriculum begin to embed these sorts of things within the curriculum? And how do we value them much more so as skills and competencies in terms of how we teach, what we teach, and what we value and assess and give credit to at the end of the day? It's one of the reasons why within the report I wanted the Scottish Credit and Qualifications Framework to be part of the new national agency, which will not be Education Scotland. But of course, we're preparing children and young people for work as well. And there's an interesting uh, report, World Economic Forum, that I looked at in 2020. And it basically said, from business and industry within the UK, here are the kinds of skills and competences that we feel are necessary for the future. And again, you can see in that list a whole range of things about problem solving, about emotional intelligence, creativity, analytical thinking. We know all of these things. How do we 
grasp the thistle, so to speak, and actually embed them within a curriculum in order that we can offer young people the best deal possible. Ken Robinson, uh, sadly now deceased, uh, I think made a very important point here when he made, when he, when he, quote, he was quoted to say that, you know, many highly talented, brilliant, creative people think that they're not because the thing they were good at at school wasn't valued or actively stigmatised. How do we create the kind of environment within which wider attainment and wider achievement is better recognised? And the kinds of skills and competencies that we're talking about are more embedded in the curriculum and better valued. Many of you will have read Tom Fletcher's book, uh, Ten Survival Skills, and I picked out simply three quotes from it, which I think we need to think about as a provocation for today. You know, the sorts of things that that we need in order to survive as individuals, but just as importantly for society to survive in the kind of uncertain future, but also to survive the certainties that we know will be within that future. So what my report tries to do is to say, we need a much more bottom-up hierarchy. We need a system whereby that middle ground is rationalised significantly, where policy is generated from the bottom up, where the curriculum is generated from the bottom up and curriculum change is generated from the bottom up on an ongoing basis. That the formulation of policy is not from top down but using the expertise on the ground. And there is genuine empowerment and agency at the, at the sharp end because that's where the expertise is. In your classrooms, civil servants and politicians are not experts in geography or indeed experts in education. And Turning that around, I think, is probably a 10-year job in Scottish education. But it goes with the grain of, with a lot of what is happening in some other countries where they've recognised that now is the time for significant reform. So just leaving you with a couple of questions uh, to think about at the end. And again, as I say, you can digest those in your own time. But I think there are lots of questions there about the extent to which we are adequately preparing, both within geography and within education in general, preparing young people to thrive and for society to thrive in the future. And what can geography offer in, in addressing some of these questions? That's largely what today is about. I think there are roles for RSGS and for SAGT and for all of you as geographers about influencing curriculum change in the future. It won't happen immediately. But I do think that government is serious about reform. I think it recognises that this is a point in time where we need to use this window of opportunity to engage in radical consideration of change within the education system. And as I say, I think there are a whole host of things there. That second bullet in particular, interdisciplinary learning. We often talk about geography being the great interdisciplining subject uh, that brings things together. And there is a recognition in the group that Louise Hayward is leading about how we better provide opportunities for more interdisciplinary learning and recognising that through the certification that a young person might take at their exit point from school. So hopefully that not only sets a bit of context in some of the wider world that we all inhabit uh, and that we all exist in. If anybody wants to catch up with me on any of this, by all means, uh, you can email me, uh, and if you want an early set of the slides, as I say, they will be available uh, through a link. But if you want an early set of the slides, just let me know. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much.